Welcome to Human Rights Education Now, a podcast series from Human Rights Educators USA. I'm your host, Bill Fernikes, a member of the National Steering Committee of HRE USA, a collaborative network to learn, teach, organize, advocate, and innovate for human rights education in the United States. This podcast aims to raise awareness about human rights education and invites listeners to engage with the worldwide movement to make human rights education a core focus of educational programs from preschool through higher education and in both non-formal and informal community educational settings. Today's program is a conversation with Audrey Osler, Professor Emerita of Citizenship and Human Rights Education at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom and Editor-in-Chief of Human Rights Education Review. In this episode, Audrey discusses the origins of her interest in human rights and human rights education, how her transnational work in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the United States has influenced her human rights education work, the connections between democratic citizenship education and human rights education, how human rights education can address the challenges facing marginalized communities, and how the legacy of colonialism has impacted her own family and the population of contemporary Britain. It is really my great pleasure to be speaking with Audrey Osler today, who is one of the world's leading experts on human rights education and on global citizenship education. How are you doing today, Audrey? I'm fine, and I'm very, very happy to be included in this podcast series. So thanks for inviting me, Bill. So tell us how you first became interested in human rights issues and subsequently in human rights education. Right. Well, when I think about human rights issues, I realized that I've probably been interested in them as long as I was from when I was a very small child. Um, I think I came from a family that was quite political. So, for example, when I was a very small child, and I think it would have been around 1960, at the time of the Sharpeville massacre, my father decided that we were not going to have any South African goods in the house. And like this was well before any uh, international boycotts of South Africa. So, and it wasn't at the time when we got a lot of fresh fruit, but we banned we were banned from buying uh, peaches and banned from buying other tinned fruit, canned fruit from uh, South Africa. So I, I have never come across another kid who was um, who who had this as part of their childhood. So when the boycotts came in against South Africa, you know, more much probably two decades later, this was not news to me. This was something that had been practiced in my childhood home uh, by my father uh, from an early age. So I think probably we got a lot of politics and human rights issues brought to us at home. But I think that human rights education came to me from a very different angle because I started my career as a teacher in high school and I went to work in the city of Birmingham in the UK and I was working as an advisor or advisory teacher in the Multicultural Support Service. And while I was working in that job, I had an opportunity to travel to Denmark and the Council of Europe were working with the Ministry of Education and running a human rights education course. And so I went off to that course uh, in the 1980s, and that's what got me interested in human rights education initially, because we were working in a very difficult field where race equality issues uh, were highly politicized by the British government of the day. I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said, there's no such thing as anti-racist maths. You know, what are they up to? And uh, so I thought, great, uh, human rights. Nobody can say there's anything wrong with human rights. Not, not Thatcher government, not any government of that time. 
was challenging uh, human rights per se. So then I thought this was a really useful way of, of doing the work we were doing and communicating it so that the, the language of human rights education uh, provided me with um, initially with a with a new way of thinking about how to introduce these questions of racial justice. And it wasn't until uh, a little bit later that I really began to dawn on me. It's uh, I, human rights education provides an intersectional approach. So you can look at uh, racial justice, you can look at gender equity, you can look at a whole host of issues in an interconnected way. So really that that was my beginning into human rights education. Now you've worked, as you define it, transnationally as a scholar and teacher. Mm -hmm. So you visited China, the United States, mm -hmm. you've worked in Latin America, Norway. How have those mm -hmm. experiences uh, influenced your approach to human rights education? I think in lots of different ways, according to the different countries I visited. Um, I, I didn't ever visit the US until the early 90s. Um, and my first uh, visit to the United States was to Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And uh, it was nothing like any of the um, the Hollywood images of the United States I had ever been fed. And um, I was the guest of um, a historically um, Black university, uh, African-American um, organization. And I was, the, I was hosted by African-Americans. And so I think their way of looking at things and their struggles really uh, moved me in a in a deep way, but also I was quite shocked because some of my colleagues, uh, they actually showed me their their um, their old IDs, which spelt out, you know, what percentage black they were. And, and I was really taken aback by this. And, and I had come across uh, this kind of way of looking at race in quite such a, halfway and I actually asked at one point are there any uh any white colleagues in your university is it all black colleagues here and they said oh so and so so and so he passes for white but we know he's not so mm -hmm. it was they were very very clear about who they were and that wasn't just defined by their own culture and their own background, I felt, but also by the history of the United States, and it 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 it, it yeah, it was deeply challenging and and deeply moving. And I had to think about how much identity is shaped by laws and by history, as well as how much is shaped from within. So that that had a deep impression on me, the United States. Um, but I think. I haven't just worked as a visiting professor or spent short periods. I have worked as um, a visiting professor at Beijing Normal and been very interested in what kind of human rights education might go on in China, say, about 10 years ago, and what goes on then, what went on then and what goes on now. And, and the space, I think, has shrunk. Uh, but I was working with graduate students and I asked them uh, if they would um look at tell me the stories of their grandparents of the cultural revolution and then compare it with um the textbooks that they'd read and they they produce like little vignettes and plays on on the cultural revolution and they chose to see this big event in uh chinese history through feminist uh eyes and that that was very enlightening and very very refreshing to me. So I think what I learned from those students was that you really have to listen to people really, really carefully uh, in, in teaching and especially in human rights education. And, and yes, we have these very fine, and very, very important key principles and laws 
internationally agreed standards, but we also have to work with very real personal experiences, including in this case, these, these young people's uh, family stories. And, and that really did open up uh, my eyes in a different way. Again, in, in um, Japan, I've been uh, very privileged to spend time in Hiroshima with um, the Hibakusha people, the people who've experienced um, mm. the, um, the atomic bomb. Um, and to hear their stories. And people have gone out of their way to put me in touch with uh, people who've really gone through the most tremendous struggles in their lives. And so I think when you're in a strange country, when you're in a new environment, uh, sometimes it brings home to you very clearly what the challenges are at home and and what those um and and causes you to reflect on your own everyday challenges and to see them uh in a new light and perhaps you find new solutions so those are just some of the the ways in which it's impacted me but basically i'm saying people from around the globe have have uh enriched my life and that that's really where i've what I've learned from hearing people's stories, thinking about their meanings. So to paraphrase, I think you're suggesting that universal standards only have meaning when they're translated through the medium of local experience. Uh, absolutely. But, and, and, for, and that those standards, it may begin for some people that they learn about those standards in a theoretical way and then apply them to their experience. So I don't think it has to be one or the other as a starting point, but I think the two have to intersect at some point um, for it to be a human rights education that can survive some of the challenges we face in the globe on uh, today because... Um, you know, we're seeing very um, uh, difficult period of war. We're seeing uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're seeing what's going on in Gaza at the moment. And I think it's really, really important that we think about the concept of who is recognized as human, who's respected as human, who's who, how do we deal with conflict? How do we encourage people? to think about the enemy as human, because if you don't do that, if you can't identify with somebody whose experiences are very different from your own, then I think I think this isn't human rights education, if you like. You know, you've lost the plot. So a lot of your work has also focused on democratic citizenship. And so mm -hmm. can you discuss how you see human rights education and democratic citizenship? Where are their points of contact or points of uniqueness? All right. Well, I think in, in Europe, the space for human rights education within the school curriculum has been for a long time um, citizenship education or, uh, yes, what otherwise is known as civics, but not in that narrow sense of just uh, knowledge and how government functions and so on. So I think that is the space in which human rights education has often occurred within the full school curriculum. So um, in the 1990s, the end of the 1990s, um, Britain introduced the citizenship curriculum within England, and that particular curriculum had a big impact. Um, and it had an impact on a number of other countries, but it, it was troublingly national in focus, in, in my opinion. And so my colleague, Hugh Starkey and I, we developed the concept education for cosmopolitan citizenship. And we felt that if you that it was really important to for young people not just to and imagine their communities as multicultural and diverse, but also to reimagine them as cosmopolitan. And often the concept cosmopolitan is applied to elites, 
Whereas we were saying, actually, young people growing up in the inner city may have the potential, um, may have the skills and the opportunities and experiences to enable them to be cosmopolitan citizens, to actually know about different parts of the world, to open up their eyes to different parts of the world. And the the, way, the point of contact, as I see it, is that if you're learning about education for democratic citizenship, you might learn about the constitution, or you might learn about how government works, all, all these kinds of things. But if you're learning how to be a citizen, and you're told this is what a good US citizen looks like, or this is what a good UK citizen looks like. If you're not a citizen, and increasingly um, in our societies, we've got children who don't have these citizenship rights, then if you have if you have human rights to underpin that curriculum, then it opens up a space to say this is these are the rights we have as human beings. These are something we have in common. So you're not just kind of narrowly training people uh, to think about what is a, a good citizen of a particular city or a particular nation, but you're actually saying this is open to us all because I think a lot of the, the narrower citizenship education that takes place might feel very, very exclusive to, to a child from a family or, or an individual who doesn't have access to those citizenship rights, whereas we all have access to those human rights. And I think that's that's really been our very concrete starting point for looking at that question. Well, you raise a very significant issue, particularly in the United States. We have 11 million undocumented migrants. And uh, mm. today it's a very fraught landscape given the polarization mm. in the United States. But I think you're right that there's really a much broader conception of citizenship that really is um, too, unfortunately not embraced by many um, governments. They view it as mm -hmm. a rather narrow legalistic approach. Mm -hmm. So um, you've also discussed at great length your work with marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, seems to me to be very significant right now is the tremendous pressure on nation states to revisit their whole approach to migration. Mm, absolutely. So how do you see human rights education approaching the problem of giving full human rights to these marginalized communities? Well, I think the starting point is to try and communicate the idea that migration isn't something which has developed in our age. It's been part of of the human condition. And I think um, that that question or that that notion has often been lost in in the political rhetoric that we're of the times we're living in. Um, and it's it's not just in the United States where we're seeing increasing polarization. It seems to me that um the UK is very good at picking up some of the best things from the United States and also some of some of the worst and and the polarization and the creation of culture wars um is something which we seem to have um uh, um find ourselves in a similar position uh, here in Europe um in in the UK. So I think the starting point has to be to understand that basic thing about migration. And then I was just walking home today across a city that I don't know so very well to get a, a train. And I was looking at the people who were selling the big issue, which is the magazine sold by homeless people. And I was watching an interaction between an elderly lady and, and a young woman, and I realized it, what I know but in the faces of those two people, but a lot of the people who are living on the streets today are migrants. They're, they've been pushed right to the margins in, in so many ways. They're amongst the people without homes, and they're, they're very, very vulnerable indeed. And I was thinking about this young girl, I don't know where she was from, but I, I could tell by the way she spoke that she she was clearly not um, uh, British born or educated. And then watching her with this elderly woman who was buying the magazine and thinking how little contact we have between many 
um, marginalized communities and the mainstream society. Um, I remember once being in San Francisco at a party of some uh, human rights education friends, and we we had some spare food, and they we got out. Uh, we drove around the city looking for people to give this spare food to, and we arrived at a homeless hostel. And I remember being told, oh, come on, Audrey, you take that tray out. So I went over to this man who was sitting outside the uh, the, the um the hostel and offered him the food and I don't know if it was my, my accent or I had this huge tray of food in front of me and I don't know if it was part, part of my accent or just he wasn't expecting anybody to present him with this thing but just having to communicate with him and I was it was an elderly African American man and it was only as I turned away from him after I left the food next to him but he, cottoned on to what I was saying and I was thinking there's that was a gap between a visitor and and a resident in 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 San Francisco but that gap is as wide or is equally wide between residents and that's that's the one I think we have to try and close. I think there are interesting projects going on. I've just completed a book, an edited book with um, a colleague in Norway on Nordic perspectives on human rights education. And uh, one of the uh, projects that's uh, uh, one of the chapters by some Finnish colleagues talks about um, how schools are working with um, a migrant community um, refugees and, and some of the challenges that's arisen in that. And they're complex. They're to do with suspicion. They're to do with uh, uh, people who deliberately, as, as I think you've kind of hinted at, uh, um, promoting um, negative messages about migrants. And, and, and so, you know, like we would, went through a period when we talked about stranger danger to children it's kind of stranger danger of migrants to the rest of society we're kind of encouraged to, to keep our distance so mm. I think I think real contact does make a difference and then remembering that I mean in the city I'm living in right now Leicester we, you know the the population is made up of migrants. It's it's wave of wave after migration. And who are we? And learning our history. I think there are loads of starting points through history. And that's one of the reasons that I've um I've written uh, my most recent book, Where Are You From? Know Where Are You Really From? Because um you've got a copy there, that's fabulous. Because um I felt that it's no good writing about this notion of migration in a vacuum. So I've written about my own family as migrants across the globe, across many generations. And then I thought to myself, well, you're the first generation, Audrey, that's not migrated, gone to live permanently somewhere else. But then I've lived in a very privileged position where I've been able to go temporarily to live, you know, several months in the United States or or, or some other part of the world, and then and then return home. So I think you have to bring it alive with real stories and real people. And and increasingly, I'm I'm thinking in human rights education, we just need to tell stories and tell narratives and explore those stories and 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 get under the surface of some of these effectively lies that are being spread to us about the other that are simply constructed from nowhere they're just total falsities so I've rather lost the, the train of the question but mm -hmm. I think the marginalised people are ourselves you know I, I discovered in my own book that it was my that my three times great grandfather was homeless on the streets of London in 1789 well, that was that was a bit of a shock, really. So, um, you know, the, the, that when I see those homeless people in London now, I know that they have they're not they've not arrived there from nowhere. That 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 this has been a challenged a challenge of society over many many years, and the fact that it's 
you know, that we're seeing tents in our streets and is particularly shocking and the numbers of people. But maybe history is a reminder that this isn't this is not inevitable. There are solutions. We do have practical solutions to manage these these problems. So I'm not suggesting that this is a, uh, something that happened in history is going to happen now. But to understand that these are not outsiders, they're us. So that's a perfect tie-in to this question about your most recent book, mm -hmm. because uh, which I find fascinating. You talk a lot about relationships between family individual development, citizenship. But I'm particularly interested in how you look at the legacy of colonialism and its impact on contemporary mm -hmm. UK. Can you talk a little bit about how that relates to your own family? But as we've just been talking, this whole other diaspora. I think it's something that is, it's always been there, but hidden. So mm -hmm. in my own education, I, I studied history from the age of five through to my 20s, and my first degree was in history. In fact, my master's degree also had an element of history, and yet I never, ever learned anything about the British Empire beyond uh, a few battles drawn on a map when I was about 15 years old in India. Um, it, it really was uh, a blank to me, and the way we learn history is, course very determined by where we are in the world for example uh it wasn't until i went to the united states that i learned that that king george was a tyrant because we never referred to him as george the tyrant in in britain so i think it's recognizing that history is extremely narrowly taught um it's hugely oversimplified and so recognizing colonialism it's not surprising that some people get very very hit up say about statues or or whatever the, the the question is because they don't know the history they really really are ignorant of the history so i think the starting point is to say that a his what is a history education and how does that relate to human rights and social justice and a, the base level history cannot simply be learning. Uh, um, I don't know what the, what in the United States you might every child might learn, but you know we all learn about kings and queens and the Tudors and the Stuarts until we're, we're really bored with it. And over and over again, so it's understanding basic concepts in history like multi perspectivity that there are always there's always more than one way of looking at a problem. So when people say there are two sides to every problem, I'll say that's unusual. There are usually more than two sides to every issue. So I think colonialism is all around us, but we've been we find it difficult to recognize its its legacy. But, and then I think it depends on who we are, the degree to which we recognize it. So I think in Britain, for example, it's much harder for white citizens to recognize the history of colonialism because the, perhaps they haven't had the same stories in their families as um, as certain communities of color. And, and there will be exceptions in, in, in every grouping, but that kind of thing. So colonialism, its impact is with us. When we go to a museum, the things that are up on on display, you know, um, you know, why is it that the British Museum in London is one of the most fabulous museums in the world? Well, it's because there's been this uh, colonial history and, you know, where are these artefacts and where did they come from and, and, and have they been acquired legitimately or not? These are all fascinating questions, I think, that children would really enjoy engaging with in school and can be explained, but they're rarely ever dealt with. It's kind of, this is here, and we're going to go and look at an exhibition on the Egyptians, and it's clear cut, and we've done it, and that's how museums are approached. Colonialism is all around us. And then when I looked at my own family history, and I went to the city of Chennai, and I went into a museum there, and I looked at the map on the wall, I got a real shock, because the city was divided at certain points in the uh, 18th century between white town and black town. And one was the area of the colonists and the other was the rest. 
and the rest were very diverse. They weren't just the British. You know, the French were there, but but many, many other groupings. And, and the Indian population was very diverse because it was a trading city. So they didn't just come from that part of India. They came from all over. You know, the, the, there were Arab traders. There were all kinds of people there. So it's recognizing that diversity in history as well. And then one thing that's really um, curious to me is we imagine that um, that people of mixed heritage are something peculiar to the late 20th or early 21st century. And if you go to cities like Chennai, it simply isn't true. And it's so, so obvious. Um, we go to a city like Singapore, you know, the mix of people is 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 not just in the in the most recent age. So I think understanding all of that is quite critical to challenging people's fixed ideas. You know, those those fixed ideas I mentioned about race when we began mm -hmm. talking. I think all of that um becomes clearer. So it's about people, it's about trade. I never made any link between the Industrial Revolution and colonial history. I, I I was always taught that Britain industrialized early or first because we had loads of clever explorers, um, inventors here. I did, you know, and you know, we were taught that. I'm sure that children are still taught that. They learn the name, you know, Stevenson's uh, steam engine or whatever, and it just so happened, whereas actually the taxes from India were funding this industrial revolution. These things are not known. So we can't understand who we are unless we understand that history. And I really do think we need to seriously re examine the history curriculum. And I think as human rights educators, we probably should be pushing for um, a more open-ended, skills-based history curriculum. A more, uh, a more critical approach to Absolutely. examining these different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening to Human Rights Education Now. Our next episode concludes our conversation with Audrey Osler, a leading scholar in the field of human rights education and democratic citizenship education. You can find additional information about this podcast series at www.hreusa.org. Each episode is available on the HRE USA podcast page, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Player FM, Pocket Casts, and Deezer. They will soon be available on YouTube and SoundCloud. You can also download each episode as an MP3 file. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, send them to Christy at hreusa.org. That's K-R-I-S-T-I at hreusa.org. Our podcast team includes host and producer Bill Fernickes, executive producer Christy Redalius Palmer, editor Elizabeth Schwab, Sound Designer and Project Manager Sabrina Sanchez, Communications and Public Outreach Coordinator Jessica Terbrugan, and Production Coordinator Jasmine Chizu Gota. The Human Rights Education Now logo was designed by Kim Berring. Human Rights Education Now is a production of Human Rights Educators USA, a project of the Center for Transformative Action in Ithaca, New York.